our crown of glory. And just to bring everyone up to speed, I know there's uh, probably a few people in here that were not a part of that first service that I preached the first half of this, but we've been talking about man's crown of glory, what God has given to us when he made Adam. This is when he placed that crown of glory on man's head. And here's what happened, just to bring everyone up to speed, and we'll continue on kind of where we left off in the first place. And this should jot your memory and uh, get everyone on the same page. Does that sound okay? Yes. So Satan tried to overthrow the throne of God. And he and one-third of the angelic hosts tried to do this. But he found out real quick just how powerful God was, and he was cast out of heaven. And Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from the sky. Hallelujah. He saw Satan fall like lightning from the sky. And when Satan hit the earth, the four corners of the earth, the earth became void. It became desolate. There was darkness upon the face of the deep. It was void. It was a waste place, you could say. But the thing is, is that's not the way that God created the earth to be. And what a lot of people don't understand is there was a vast amount of time between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. A lot of space and time took place there. But earth was an exact duplicate of heaven. And when God made Adam and hovered, above, hovered over the, the darkness of the face of the deep, and he said, let there be light, and light was, darkness had to get out of light. It cannot coexist. None of that nonsense. Light cannot coexist with darkness. And when light shows up, darkness has to go. Amen? Amen. And so darkness flee. Well, that just put Satan on the outside. Okay? God's telling him, you're not going to reign in heaven, and you're not going to reign on earth. And so God made Adam in the exact likeness and image of Almighty God. And he, he created Eve also, and in his likeness and image created he male and female. And God placed them in a beautiful place called the Garden of Eden. Amen? And, and what God gave to Adam was the crown of glory, which represented every single thing that God was and God is. Okay? The crown of glory. All authority, all dominion. He had it all, and it was resonating inside of a man, Adam, mankind, who he just created. Right. And God told him, you dress and keep this garden, you protect it, you preserve it from all intruders. And he told him, I ask you one thing. Do not eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And he slapped him on the shoulder and said, All right, Adam, I'll see you this evening, and we'll walk and talk in the cool of the day. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Well, we all know what happened. Satan came and persuaded Eve, but we can't get too hard on Eve because Adam was standing right there watching. He had authority to stop that serpent. He had authority to, to smite what he was doing. He had authority to cast him down and tell him to get out. Right. And God told him, You protect and preserve this planet from him and his demonic hosts. And Adam did not. And he willingly took that fruit, and the moment he took that fruit and bit it, he was not the man he once was prior to eating that fruit. Right. Satan grabbed that crown of glory, took it off Adam's head, and placed it on his own head, and now he's in the driver's seat. He's in control. He has the authority, he has the, the dominion, and that just put God on the outside. Now God's on the outside looking in. Adam lost it, sin entered the earth, and the hearts of man was changed at this very moment. The seed of spiritual death was lodged in every man's heart in this moment when Adam willingly bowed his knee to Satan. And this is where we left off. Genesis chapter 3, just a refresher, we've already covered this uh, a month ago, but just to bring everyone up to speed. Genesis chapter 3, 14 through 15. It says, So then the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle, more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat the dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. And he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Now I want you to notice, once again, before God ever left the presence of this new ruler of this planet, he prophesied to him. He threatened him, praise God, and he said to the serpent, because you have done this, I'm going to put enmity between your seed and her seed. Notice he did not say, I'm going to put enmity between your seed and his seed. He said, her seed, her seed, her seed. Right here, God is prophesying the virgin birth in the third chapter of Genesis. But once again, the devil did not pick up on it because he lost his ability to reach into the wisdom of God and understand what God was saying. 
He had no idea what God was saying here. All he knew was God was going to raise up a mighty one that was going to bruise his head. In other words, Satan is now ruler of this planet, but he has a threat hanging over his head. He can't really enjoy his rulership because he knows God is going to raise up a mighty one that's going to bruise his head, take that crown back, take that authority back, and put it in man's hands in whom it belongs. Hallelujah. Amen. And he said, her seed. Everyone say, her seed. Her seed. And that completely threw the devil. You see, childbirth is never referred to as the seed of woman. It's always referred to as the seed of man. And he said, her seed is going to break your power. And right now, in Scripture, Satan's got the power. He's in control. It looks like it's all hopeless. All hope is lost. Adam willingly bowed his knee. In the natural, where we're at right now, it looks like, in a lot of ways, all hope is lost. Things look kind of bleak out there, if you haven't noticed. But I'm telling you, just like in Scripture, and I'm telling you right now in the natural, God has a plan. That's right. God has a plan. And right now, where we left off in Scripture, Satan has got that crown. He's got that, that power. He's got the keys to death, hell, and the grave. But God has a plan. Hidden in a mystery. Amen? Amen. Hidden in a mystery. So God leaves a threat over the head of this new ruler. Oh, yeah, he's in charge now. He's in the driver's seat, but he doesn't have total joy about it. He's got that threat hanging over his head. And he said, her seed is going to bruise your head. He said, I'm going to raise up a mighty deliverer, and he's going to get that crown back. He's going to get that power back. He's going to get that authority back. He's going to get this planet back. And I'm telling you now, Satan, I've already told you once, and I'm telling you again, you're not going to reign in heaven, and you're not going to reign in earth. Your time and rulership is limited. Amen. And so Satan, he begins to set up his kingdom on this planet. And the next thing you read over in the Bible in Noah's time, you see Satan is the illegitimate stepfather of mankind at this point. The seed of spiritual death is lodged in every man's heart, not the nature of God, the nature of Satan. And the Bible tells us over in Genesis 5 and 6 that the thoughts of man are evil continually. And God is not pleased with the way this planet is shaping up under Satan's rulership. And there came a great flood and it destroyed mankind except Noah and his family because they found grace in the sight of God. Right. And Noah and his family began to start up another generation of people, yet there was still that spiritual death that was lodged in every man's heart. But they dared to believe God. Now, I want you to notice Satan's position here, okay? I want you to notice his position. He's watching this flood take place. He watches all of mankind destroyed, and he's the one that has perverted their thoughts, perverted their minds. He's caused them to be evil continually, and he watches that flood wipe out an entire race except Noah and his family. Now, you know what the devil's thinking. He's reminded of what God told him. Her seed is going to bruise your head. And his first thought was, Noah must be the seed. I mean, I mean, after all, everyone on earth is dead, all but this man and his family. He must be the seed. I mean, anyone who doesn't have any better sense than to build an ark in a desert when it hasn't rained in years has got to be able to bust your head. But did you know that Satan had to stand around and watch Noah live 950 years, and Noah died and realized after 950 years of close scrutiny that Noah is not the seed? Can you imagine? Living 950 years with a threat over you head, your head, and the guy you thought is going to do it dies. And then God starts to talk to an old boy by the name of Abraham. Everyone say Abraham. Abraham. And he's nearly 100 years old, and his wife is 90, and God appears to him and says, Thy wife shall conceive, and thou shalt bear a son, and his seed shall be mighty in the earth. And Satan's listening to all this, you know. So he's got his mind off of Noah, because Noah died. Now he's got to watch Abraham real close. Yeah. And Satan's thinking, this might be the seed that's going to bust my head. And so he's watching Abraham very closely, and Abraham dares to believe God. Right. And he confessed for 25 years, I'm going to stand on God's word. And he said, your wife shall bear a child. And for 25 years, Abraham kept confessing, I am the father of many nations. I am the father of many nations. I am the father of many nations. Nobody in town believed it, but Abraham and Sarah decided they were going to believe God. And after 25 years, Isaac is born supernaturally. And the first thing Satan thinks is, it's got to be Abraham. It's got to be Abraham. Anybody who doesn't have any better sense than to confess for 25 years after he's 100 years old that he's going to have a son has got to be able to bust your head after giving birth to a boy and he's too old and his wife's womb is dead. Dead, I better watch this guy close. Yeah. Amen? Amen? But he has to hang around 175 more years until Abraham dies. 175 more years, church. Then Abraham dies. 
Well, he's a little bit relieved because it's not Abraham. The only problem is her seed. Thy seed is going to bruise thy head. He's still got that threat hanging over him. And so he starts to watch Isaac. After all, Isaac was born supernaturally. It could be him. But he has to wait around and watch Isaac die. And then God starts to talk to men and raise up men that start prophesying of the great Messiah. And I mean, every time God starts to raise up a prophet, he has to watch him very close because that prophet might be the one. The only problem is just about the time Satan has it figured out and says to himself, this guy's the one, this prophet's the one, that prophet stands up and says, no, there's one mightier than I coming. Hallelujah. Oh, dear Jesus. You talk about keeping a guy frustrated, keeping a guy in the dark. Satan had no idea who it was going to be. He thought it was Noah. He thought it was Abraham. He thought it was Isaac. And when Isaac dies, God talks to an old boy, 80 years old, herding sheep on the backside of the desert called Moses. Everyone say Moses. Moses. Now, you have to understand, Satan hadn't really thought much of, about Moses, hadn't paid much attention to him. But all of a sudden, this guy walks into Egypt, into Pharaoh's court, throws his rod on the ground and says, the great I am sent me and you better let the people go. Yeah. And oh, dear God, he says, we have another one. All hell is alerted, and Satan watches that rod turn into a serpent. He watches Moses' rod swallow up all the magician's rods. He watches that Nile turn to blood, and he watches that plague of frogs overtake the land. He watches three million people get led out of the bondage of Egypt by Moses. He watches him get to that Red Sea when there's no way to cross it. There's no way to get around it, and he stands up there and proclaims, God is on our side. Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. God will fight our fight for us. He watches that Red Sea split, and all of God's people cross on dry ground and then he watches the Egyptian army swallowed up when that seed comes together and when they get to the other side Miriam is praising God for two chapters and Moses starts praising God and Satan is thinking dear God the seed's here <laughs> we all thought it was the seed Moses but Moses dies you talk about frustrating the devil <laughs> Satan just knew it had to be Moses Moses dies who could it be then there comes a boy by the name of Joshua. Everyone say Joshua. Joshua. There comes a boy by the name of Joshua. And old Joshua, he doesn't have any better sense than to lead people around the walls of Jericho for six days. And Satan's thinking, oh, look at this idiot. He doesn't have any better sense than to march around the walls for six days. And he knows as well as I do, ain't nothing going to happen. But on the seventh day when they go out there and they blow those trumpets and they shout with a loud shout, the earth swallowed up those walls. They fell down flat and all of a sudden Satan has a new seed to deal with. Joshua. And then just to really rattle Satan a little bit, Joshua stands up one day just to really aggravate the devil, church. I'm telling you, God just put this one in just to really jab him in the side. He stands up one day, Joshua stands up one day and says, Sun, stand still. Moon, don't you move. And they obey him. And all of a sudden, Satan is thinking, my God, he's here. Anybody that can stop the sun and the moon and make them stand still and they listen to him surely can bust your head. But Joshua dies. Satan's like, my dear God, I can't take much more of this. And, old, and then an old boy by the name of Samson comes on the scene. Y'all heard of Samson? Yeah. Samson? This guy with his bare hands, when the spirit of the Lord comes on him, tears a lion to pieces. Have you ever tore a lion to pieces? Nope. Not to mention, when the spirit of the Lord came on him, took a jawbone of a donkey and killed a thousand men. And the moment Satan saw uh, Samson kill a thousand men with a jawbone of a donkey, he begins to alert all of his forces and say, the seed is here, the seed is here. Anybody that can kill a thousand men with a jawbone of a donkey surely can bust your head. Then Samson dies. Then there's an old boy by the name of Elijah who comes on the scene. And God's tormenting the devil here, church. He's really giving him up the river. And did you notice every one of these guys that God raises up, none of them are lightweight fellas? They're not a bunch of little sissies running around saying, the Messiah's coming, the Messiah's coming. No, they take over. Amen? I mean, just about the time the devil thinks, I got rid of Samson, I got rid of David, I got rid of Abraham, I got rid of Moses, I got all these guys out of the way. Here comes a guy by the name of Elijah that is something else. Have you ever read about Elijah? Yes. Woo! I mean, the very first time you hear his name, he walks into King Ahab's court. He is Elijah the Tishbite, whatever that is. He walks into the King Ahab's court. Nobody's ever heard anything about the guy. And he stands up there and says, may I have the attention of everyone in this court, please? And the king says, who's he? The guy says, Elijah the Tishbite. The king says, what's a Tishbite? The guy says, I don't know. Well, that's what he is, Elijah the Tishbite. And the king said, what do you have to say, Elijah the Tishbite? And Elijah says, I have one announcement for all of you. 
It ain't going to rain no more till I say so. Good day. And he gets out of there. And church, it did not rain for three and a half years. It didn't rain for three and a half years. Now, you know what the devil's thinking. Oh, here's another one. This guy can stop the rain. And just to really aggravate the devil, Elijah challenges 450 of his prophets one day. And I'm telling you, puts them to shame. After he puts them to shame, kills every one of them. Satan's prophets. Finally, God calls Elijah up in a whirlwind. Satan is grateful for it, wipes the sweat off his brow and says, God, glad we got rid of that one. The only problem is there's another guy right behind him named Elisha who got a double portion. Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. And now for the first time, this guy stands up with a double portion and he takes that mantle that fell from Elijah and he stands up in front of the old Jordan River and church, I'm going to tell you that old Jordan River got to where it didn't know what to do anymore. Every time a prophet come, he stopped the thing from running. That old Jordan River doesn't know what to do anymore. It doesn't know which way to run, whether to run at all, run dry, or just stand there. And the first thing old Elisha does with a double portion, this prophet, he takes that mantle and says, where's the God of Elijah? And Satan says, you don't have to say that so loud. And he goes up there and splits that Jordan River and he crosses over on dry ground and does twice as many miracles. Frustrates the devil twice as much. The devil doesn't know what to do. Finally, Elisha goes on. This is running the devil up the wall, church. He's in control, but he's got that threat hanging over his head. Her seed is going to break your power. And God raises up Isaiah. And Isaiah begins to prophesy of the virgin birth. He begins to talk about a Messiah. And oh, Satan can't stand that. He's been hearing that since the Garden of Eden. And, and Isaiah begins to prophesy of the virgin birth. He begins to prophesy of the Prince of Peace that's coming. He begins to talk about the one that is coming to take the government on his shoulders. And folks, I want you to know this is driving the devil up the wall. He's in control, but he's been de dealing with this for years and years, hundreds of years. And all of a sudden, Isaiah begins to prophesy of it. Jeremiah prophesies of it. Ezekiel prophesies of it. And all of a sudden, after one day, after the last prophet that God raises up, there is silence in the earth for years. There's no prophet in the land. And Satan can't figure out why am I not having to deal with anybody. Finally, all the cohorts of hell begin to agree. You've won. Every seed God raised up, you destroyed. That means you've won. And you see, that's exactly what God wanted him to think. He kept it silent in the earth for just a while to make the devil think he'd forgotten all about it. And then one day, a fellow by the name of John the Baptist shows up. And church, he's shouting in the wilderness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's shouting in the wilderness, and the people start coming out there, and the devil starts to perk up, you know, a little bit because he wants to hear what this guy has to say. He's another prophet in the land, and he says, the seed is on his way. I'm not him. I'm not even worthy to, to latch his sandals, but I tell you one thing. He's on his way, and when he comes, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. He's on his way. It's almost time. And church, I want you to know all of a sudden there's been a great silence in the earth, but now we have another prophet in the land. He's talking about it's right around the corner. All of a sudden, all hell is alerted. They've been awakened. There's an alarm that goes off. The seed is coming. They don't know who it is. Satan don't know who it is, so he's still guessing. Then one day when Jesus reaches an age of approximately 30 years old, of course, Satan at that particular time hadn't paid much attention to Jesus because after all, he's just a carpenter's boy. Who would have ever think and suspect that the carpenter's boy would be the seed? It wasn't Moses. It wasn't Isaiah. It, it wasn't Elijah. It wasn't Elisha. It wasn't David. It wasn't Samson. Who would have ever thought that the carpenter's boy from a little old town of Nazareth would be the seed? We're not even going to pay any attention to this guy. Who does he think he is? But then one day, everyone say one day. One day. That boy grew up. And he reaches an age of 30 years old and he goes out into the wilderness where that prophet is prophesying about the great one who is coming to deliver and break Satan's power. And Jesus walks out there in the Jordan River where John is baptizing people and he says, I have need to be baptized of thee. And all of a sudden, church, John knows, hallelujah, John knows it's him. Nobody else knows it's him, but John knows it's him. And he begins to baptize Jesus in the Jordan River. And all of a sudden, there is a voice that comes from heaven that says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Hallelujah. And for the first time in thousands of years the, since the Garden of Eden, Satan now knows who the seed is. And did you notice the very next thing that happened? He began to tempt him. That's right. He began to tempt him. And church, I'm telling you, the fight was on. 
He finally finds out Jesus of Nazareth is the seed that God prophesied about in the third chapter of Genesis. And the next thing you see in the account of Luke chapter 4 that I want you to turn to this morning. Are you all getting this? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Luke chapter 4. I want you to remember also while you're turning there in Luke chapter 4. Man's crown was stripped from him. Okay. Job 19 says, man was stripped of his crown. Job said, I had he had stripped me of my glory and taken the crown from my head. The psalmist in Psalms 78 and verse 61 described it this way and said, He delivered his strength into captivity and his glory into the enemy's hands. So therefore, Satan's got man's crown. Satan's got that crown of glory. And Jesus, God sent Jesus to go get it back. Does everyone understand this? The Bible says that for this purpose... The Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, I want to remind you of this scripture before we get into Luke chapter 4. When Adam fell, he lost his authority. When he fell, he lost his authority. His crown was lifted from his head. And this should put Romans 3.23 to make a little bit more sense instead of just a scripture we use to condemn people. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In other words, Satan lifted that crown from Adam's head and put it on himself. And when he fell, when man fell, he fell short of the glory of God. In other words, the power, the attributes, the characteristics emanating from God, flowing through man. Man didn't have access to that like he did before Adam sinned. Man fell short of the glory of God. And when Satan found out who the seed was, he, was, he immediately began to launch an all-out attack against Jesus. He knew that this was the man that God was prophesying about in Genesis chapter 3. Now look at Luke chapter 4. Let's read this. I want to show you something here. And this is powerful, church. In verse 1 it says, And the Lord, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan, was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being forty days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, he afterward hungered. And the devil said unto him, If thou be... If thou be. Now, you see, God had already told him, this is my beloved son. This is the seed. And Satan, you know, had to have all this pulled on him for thousands of years. He thought it was Noah. He thought it was Abraham. He thought it was Moses. So it's not really ignorance on Satan's part. He didn't want to be uh, controlled or persuaded because he knew he had put a lot of effort into all these other guys just to find out they're not the seed. And so he says, if thou be who I think you be. If you are the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. And Jesus said, saying unto him, It is written. Everyone say, It is written. It is written. Men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And Satan realizes in this moment, this is not going to be an easy fight. This man fights hard. He uses a sword. Satan backs off. He begins to tempt him from another angle. And he says this, and the devil taking him up to a high mountain showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, now I want you to get this church, I want you to read this verse very closely. You talk about a dirty trick. This is the devil at his worst. And the devil said to him, all this power will I give thee and the glory of them. All this power will I give thee and the glory of them. Now you see, this is what Jesus came for church this is what he came back to get he came to get that power back he came to get that crown back and satan's offering it to him right here he says all this power and the glory of them will i give thee because it's been delivered unto me and i can give it to whomsoever i will give it if thou shalt worship me all shall be thine and i want you to know and get this picture there is silence in heaven heaven is in silence at this moment you see, the Bible says that Jesus came as the last Adam. He came as a man. He had every opportunity to fail just like we did, just like Adam. Now, did you notice Satan pulled the same trick on Jesus? Something to eat? He offered him something to eat. I'm sure that you would be thinking about food after 40 days without it too. That's awful tempting. But the second Adam passed that test, Jesus. Amen. And Satan realizes that he's got a Superman that he's dealing with here. He's got to do something different. He realizes he's not just a pushover, so he goes right to the heart of the matter. He says, I know what you're after. You're after this power. You're after this planet. You're after this crown of glory. And I tell you what I'm going to do, Jesus. I'm going to give it to you if you bow down and you worship me. 
And I want you to notice at that moment, the plan of redemption is hanging on, hinging on whatever Jesus does next. Now somebody always says, oh, Jesus didn't even have a second thought about it. He was never even tempted. Not even a problem. Hey, if Jesus didn't, be, didn't have a second thought about it, it would not have constituted a temptation. That's right. right? Have you ever been tempted to do something? Uh -huh. That means you considered it. You rolled it around in your mind and you thought of the outcome of this. Right? right. Jesus was tempted. Everyone say, Jesus was tempted. Jesus was tempted. He was tempted. And we need to realize Jesus came as a man. That's, a, that's the beautiful part of the gospel, church. He was tempted in every manner like as we are, yet without sin. And that tells me that Jesus has gone through everything that I will ever go through, and he has proved that we can overcome it. That's right. You know, it would be one thing if we serve somebody that's never been through what we've been through, doesn't know anything about it, and is always telling us, just do this, just do this, and doesn't have a clue about it. Well, Jesus has been through it all. He knows what it's like to live on this planet. He knows what it's like to, to, to have every test come against us. And Jesus passed every test, and he had every opportunity to fail just like we do. And Satan said, you've come for the power, you've come for this glory, and I'm going to give it to you if you bow down and you worship me. And Jesus is standing there. He's tempted. I mean, church, this is what he came for. This is it. It would be easy just to bow down and worship the devil, and that would be the end of it. That's right, the end of it. At that moment, Satan would have taken full charge of not only earth, but the universe, because Jesus was heaven's representative. And if Jesus would have bowed down in that moment and said, I worship thee, then Satan would have done what he was trying to do when he got kicked out of heaven. He would have exalted himself immediately above the Most High God. Yeah. Does everyone understand this? Yeah. And church, I want you to know, heaven is standing in silence, watching what Jesus is going to do. And boy, I want you to know, Jesus slaps the devil so hard, Hallelujah. He slaps the devil so hard. He said, listen to this. Listen to what he said. And Jesus answered him and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou, you see, he's talking to the devil now, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God. And church, Jesus puts it right on the line right here and says, I'm going to tell you what, Satan. Jesus is prophesying to the devil now. He's telling him, when this is all said and done, son, I'm going to tell you who's going to be worshiping who. Hallelujah. The Bible already said in Philippians, Paul said in Philippians, that at the sound of that name, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And you see, all of Satan's cohorts and him are going to do that. His whole gang are going to do that. And when this is all said and done, all of Satan and his demons are going to bow down in the presence of Almighty God and say of a truth, Jesus is Lord. And Jesus turned to him immediately and said, Satan, get behind me. It is written, thou shalt worship the Lord. He's not only quoting him on God's commandment, but he's prophesying to him and telling him, I've come to destroy your works. I am the seed that's going to break your power, and you shall worship me, the Lord your God, and me only shall you serve. Hallelujah. Amen. And church, I want you to know hell is taken back by this statement. They were not expecting that out of this man. All of Satan's demons run, start running to their champions saying, you better do something, you better do it quick, or we're in trouble. This guy sounds like he means business. And so Satan takes him up to the temple. He decides, I'm going to have to get me some scriptures to deal with this, this guy, pervert them a little bit. And he brought him to Jerusalem, it says, and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, if thou be the son of God, cast thyself down from hence, for it is written... You see, the devil realizes that Jesus means business, so he's going to try to deceive him with Scripture. Take it out of its setting, pervert it a little bit, and get Jesus to commit suicide standing on the Word of God. And you see, when Satan runs into a word person, somebody that won't bow, the only thing that he has left is deception. Everyone say deception. deception. He's got nothing left to, to, to do but pervert the Word of God. But if that won't get you, he's got nothing left. Amen. If you won't fall for that, he's got nothing left. And he said, cast thyself down. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in thy hands. They shall bear thee up, lest thee at any time dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus answering him and said, said unto him, it is said, it is said, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Get out of here. He's telling the devil, shut up. I know what the word of God says. Get out of here. He's still letting the devil know who's boss. Amen. Jesus is in control. Do you remember what Jesus said in the closing part of his ministry? For three and a half years, he has dealt nothing but misery to the devil. And one day, he goes up there and he says to his disciples, the prince of this world cometh, but he has nothing in me. 
The prince of this world cometh, but he ain't got nothing in me. He didn't even call him king. He had called him prince. Hallelujah. Then after three and a half years of absolute misery to the devil, Satan had never been dealt any harder blow from any other man that God raised up than he did from Jesus in three and a half years. He healed all the sick. I mean, Jesus wreaked havoc of hell. Do you get this picture? Yes. He absolutely wreaked havoc of hell. He healed all the sick. He destroyed the works of the devil. But for after three and a half years, the plan of redemption for mankind to be recovered, for man's authority to be given back to him, the fullness of time had come. And all of a sudden, Jesus drops his guard one day. One of his own betrays him, and he's taken to Pilate's court. And Satan's standing there. He's thinking, why is this guy helpless at this time? He can't figure it out. The Bible said, had the princes of this world known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Right. Jesus is the Lord of glory. Turn to your neighbor and say, Jesus is the Lord of glory. And the Bible said, had Satan and his cohorts known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Right. Jesus is taken to the cross. He's taken to Pilate's court. He appears helpless, and Satan uh, can't figure out what's going on, but he gets all the religious people to cry out, crucify him, crucify him. He's taken to Calvary to be crucified. He is stripped of his clothes, and Satan makes a mockery of him, an all-out mockery of him, and he incites the people. He, his, his main goal is to completely annihilate Jesus, and before he does it, he decides to make a complete mockery of him and gets the people to, to instead of making that crown of glory, make a crown of thorns representing defeat, and they place that crown of thorns on Jesus' head, and Satan inspires them to really go out and mock the plan of God by putting that inscription above his head, which said, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. And all hell is laughing. And Satan is thinking, if you would have only bowed down and worshipped me when I offered you this crown, when I offered you this power, you wouldn't be standing there on that cross with that crown of thorns over your head, with that inscription above your head that everyone's laughing at. The Bible said the people walked by and mocked and laughed and shook their heads at Jesus. And as far as the people were concerned, as far as hell and all of his demons were concerned, Jesus had failed in his mission to get man's authority back. But church, that's exactly what God wanted him to think. Hallelujah. That's exactly what God wanted him to think. And Jesus gave up the ghost, went into the bowels of this earth, and on the third day, glory to God, on the third day, Jesus is justified. And while Satan is rejoicing and all of hell is in this great celebration, this great party that's going on, on down in hell, Jesus is justified right in the midst of their party. I like to think Jesus is the greatest party crasher you'll ever meet. <laughs> Hallelujah. And while Satan is rejoicing, Jesus comes in and crashes the party. Jesus is justified. And church, he walks right over there, and the first thing he does is walk right up to Satan's throne. And the first thing he does, the king of glory, that is, is lift that crown from Satan's head. Lifts that crown from his head, and he puts that crown on his head and disrobes the devil. The Bible said he took his armor that he trusted in, disrobed the devil in this moment, stripped him of authority, reaches over there and takes the keys off his belt to death, hell, and the grave, and Jesus has now got the crown that Adam once wore. He stripped Satan and disrobed him of his authority. He has taken from him the keys of death, hell, and the grave, and while Satan is standing there watching, Jesus turns to all Satan's cohorts and all his enemies, and right there, he strips them and he spoils principalities and powers and makes a show of them openly, triumphant in it. Hallelujah. And Jesus makes happy of hell. Yes. Hallelujah. Jesus makes havoc of hell. And for the first time since the Garden of Eden, Satan does not have that crown that Adam once wore. Amen. For the first time, he doesn't have that crown. Jesus has got it. And he goes up there into the upper regions called paradise. He goes up there and tells all those Old Testament saints, it's just like God promised you. You all died in faith, not receiving the promise, but today it is fulfilled. And he preached the gospel to them, got them all born again, and led captivity captive, it says. Ooh. Hallelujah. And I want you to know when he led them out, old David's right behind Jesus. Jesus is the firstborn of many, many brethren, he says. And he begins to ascend to the throne of God with all of God's Old Testament saints right behind him. Praise God. And old David is leading that whole gang. And David begins to shout in Psalms 24, Lift up ye heads, O ye gates. Be lifted up, you everlasting doors. And let the King of glory shall come in. Hallelujah. The King of glory shall come in. 
and he begins to shout on the way up, Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Jesus is the King of glory. Yes. Amen. And I want you to know heaven's gates open up in this moment. And in the very portals of heaven, Jesus stands there before the throne of Almighty God with that crown that Adam once had in the Garden of Eden. Jesus has got it. And he tells his father, I did it. I did it. I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. He's got the crown. He's got the crown that belonged to man. And God welcomes his son and says, again, I am your father. And again, you are my son. Hallelujah. And he anoints him with the oil of gladness, hands him the scepter of righteousness, exalts his name above every name, confers all power and authority upon him, has his angels to bow down and worship him, and calls him God and says, your throne is forever. Hallelujah. And Satan is in hell watching his authority, no longer his possession. He's helpless. He has no authority. And Jesus on that great inauguration day, church, hallelujah is proclaimed King of kings, Lord of lords, and his name has been conferred upon its all power, all authority. God sits down and turns the universe over to Jesus. Jesus then goes back into the earth with that crown because that's where it belongs, in earth, not in heaven, but in earth. And God sits down, turns the universe over to Jesus. Jesus has the glory. He has that crown. And, and he appears to his disciples, and he does exactly what God did to Adam. He breathed on them and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost, and put the crown back on their head. Amen. Hallelujah. He put the crown back on their head. Thank you, Jesus. And all of a sudden, men are transpired. All of a sudden, while Jesus is standing there, breathes on them, puts the crown back on their head, he tells them, All power, all authority has been given unto me, both in heaven and in earth. Now you take this power, you take this name, you wear that crown like Adam should have worn it, you cast out the devil, you lay hands on the sick and they shall recover, you heal the sick, you raise the dead, you trample down the powers of the enemies. Glory to God. Then Jesus tells those disciples, you go to Jerusalem and you tarry there until you are endued with power from on high. Hallelujah. And he ascends back into heaven, sits down at the right hand of God the Father, and he and Jesus join hands in celebration and excitement. Hallelujah. He is the king. All of his angels circle the throne saying, worthy is the lamb, worthy is the lamb, worthy is the lamb. Oh, glory to God. All of heaven is rejoicing. All of heaven is rejoicing over Jesus' great victory. He has conquered the enemy. Hallelujah. Amen. And now he sits down at the right hand of God. He puts that crown back on the head of man in whom it belongs, praise God. And the next thing you know, we realize that man has been given authority over this planet like Adam had in the beginning. And now it is our responsibility to dress and keep it, protect it, preserve it from all intruders. And church, when I tell you, when, when Satan tries to come into your house, you get that crown fit on real good and you bow up like a king and you decree, out of my house, out of my home, out of my family, in the name of Jesus, you you go because you have been given the power now. You're in the driver's seat. And when the devil tries to bring up your past, you remind him of his future. When the devil reminds you of your past, you remind him of his future. He has no hope. And we have been given the crown. We're in the driver's seat now, church, because of Jesus and what he did. We have the crown of glory. Because it was meant to be ours from the very beginning. And Jesus got it back. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lift up your hands and just begin to praise him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we praise your name. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness. We thank you, Lord, for the authority that you've given to us in the name of Jesus. We receive you, the Holy Spirit. We receive you. We're so grateful for those disciples who were so steadfast and waited those days. Man, they could have been discouraged, but Lord, they stayed there and they tarried there and they obeyed you and you sent the mighty Holy Spirit and it ignited the world on fire. And so, Lord, we're a part of that and we receive that today. And we cast you down, Satan, right now in Jesus' name. I break in this place every soul tie in the name of Jesus. Everything that doesn't belong, everything that has held you back, I break the soul ties that you have been connected to that are still controlling your emotions right now in Jesus' name. We've been given authority, and I break them. I sever them off of your hearts now in Jesus' name. 
Satan, you have no control. And we break your power in Jesus' name. You have no power. You've been stripped of it. You have no, no keys to death, hell, and the grave. We are in control now. And Lord, we give you praise and we give you thanks for that authority. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Lord, for your encouragement. If I feel an urgency in, in the Holy Spirit. I feel an urgency that there is something that's about to take place that is way beyond what we have ever seen or experienced. And it was explained to me like it's a horse in a uh, runner's trough. What is that called? Uh, at, a, at a horse race. You're a horse in that stall, ready for the gate to open, and it's about to open. Does anyone else feel that way? Does anyone else feel that you have a call on your life and you're just waiting for the opportunity to be used by God? Yes. Amen? Amen. Right. Don't all speak up at once. Come on. It can be really intimidating to be used by God, but the thing is, is when you say yes to Jesus, you find out what life is all about. Right. You find out what you're here on this planet to do. You're here to meet the needs of humanity. You are here to be a blessing. You are here to increase and help others. Amen? Amen. Jesus came to love. Right. Jesus came to set the captive free. Amen. He came to deliver. Right. And my God, he's delivered us. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm so grateful. Jesus. Oh, Lord. How excellent is your name. Spirit. Oh, there's an urgency. There's a hunger. And God sees you. He sees, He knows where you're at. He has not left you or forsaken you. He knows your cries, He knows where you're at, and He knows the calling. And it's time for you to get on your knees and say, God, use me. Yes. Open the door, Lord, yes. and let me run. Yes. I'm ready, Holy Spirit. I'm ready, Holy Spirit. Ho, ho, ho. You're here and you want more. You're here for a purpose. And God's about to light you up. He's about to light you up. I receive it. I don't, I can't put a time on it. I can't put an exclamation point on it. But all I know is God is on your side. He's about ready to move. And you better get ready. You better get ready. There is no time. There is no more time. There's an urgency. And it's either we press in now. Oh, we got to press in now. He sees you. He sees you. He said, I know your name. And you're here for a purpose. Just by you walking in the door, you're here because you're desperate to see a move of God. You are desperate to see a move of God. And I feel like no one's more desperate than me. I want to be more hungry than anybody, and I want you to feel the same way. And I know I'm not the only one. 
The days of, a, of the lackadaisical Christian are over. And you have to come to the end of yourself and say, Jesus, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. Come on. That's, right. Come on. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> Use me. Pour yourself out through me. I am your vessel. I choose to love. I cast down bitterness. Yes. And we exalt the name of Jesus in this place. And there's no point of bringing up your past. It's dead. It's not who you were. It's not who you are. It's who you were. That is not who is in this place today. You are, you are a new creature. And you are here because you want more of God. And I tell you what, God's going to meet you where you're at. He is going to honor you, and you better get ready. Get ready, get ready, get ready. Because he's coming. Amen. He's coming Amen. for a pure and spotless bride. And guess what? It starts with you. It starts with me. I feel an urgency. Somebody needs to hear. And your hearts are open. Your ears are open. And this is your time. This is your time to be moved by God. This is your time to say yes and stop saying no to the Holy Spirit when he prompts you to do something. Do it. I'm speaking that for myself too. I'm not exempt from this because I'm standing behind a pulpit. Forgive us, Lord, for being idle. <sighs> Forgive us, Lord, for putting up walls when we know better. Whew. We choose to love, Lord. We choose to love like you love because love breaks every chain. We choose to love our neighbor and love our family. And Father God, we give it to you. We give it to you right now in Jesus' name. Father God, take, take it. Take it, take it, take it. Because we can't do it without you, Lord. Huh. We can't do it without you, Lord. Whew. Holy Spirit, have your way. Holy Spirit, have your way. If you're uncomfortable with the Holy Spirit, you better get used to it because he's, he's your Savior. He's your Savior. And it was because of Jesus the Holy Spirit came. And Jesus is in heaven by the right hand of Almighty God, and he sent the Holy Ghost for your benefit to be here. Who do you think we worship when we come together? Holy Spirit, have your way. That needs to be the heart cry of every single person in this place. Holy Spirit, have your way. The thing about it is the Holy Spirit's not going to override your will. You have to be willing to be used by God. You have to be willing to say, Holy Spirit, you're speaking to me. And Father God, I want to speak for you. It's called being a servant, a disciple. Christ-like. We are not just Christian in name. But a lot of us have walked around under that title, that falseness of Christianity, and we have not been walking out the Christ walk. And God is speaking to you, and you know who you are. And it's time to get serious. Your life depends on it, and the lives around you depends on it. I believe that was a word for the whole church. But you might be sitting here today, and you, and you say, <laughs> that was for me individually. Receive that. Yes. Receive that. Yes. Believe me when I say this, I was not planning on coming up here and saying what I just said. <laughs> spend, spend a lot of time preparing what you're about to hear. And that wasn't in it, but the Holy Spirit, I, like I said, have your way, Lord. Yes. And the thing is, is my heart's cries to be used by God. The thing is, is 
your heart's cry needs to be, I want to be used by God. And guess what? God is no respecter of persons. Where I came from, small town, small living. How could anything good come out of Hobson? That's where I came from. But God. But God. Hallelujah. We know that that message completely blessed you. I know it blessed me. We would love to connect with you. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, as well as Rumble and BitChu. We would also love for you to head on over to our website at h2hm.org. While you're there, you can find the four ways that you can give. It's also listed on your screen below. We would love for you to partner with us. Our heart for this valley and for the Place Church is doing church as a family, as well as reaching people and changing lives. Our prayer is that you are blessed, that you are increased, and as you go into this week, you know that God is for you, so who can be against you?